You are watching the Poor Boys Horology Podcast. The podcast for watch enthusiasts on a budget. Your host for today's podcast is Dr. Ed DeVries, an amateur horologist whose personal collection includes Timex, Rolex, and everything in between. If you are interested in dive watches, dress watches, designer watches, military watches, automatic watches, hand winding watches, quartz watches, or pocket watches the Poor Boys Horology Podcast is about to become your favorite podcast. So click like and subscribe. Then sit back, relax, and enjoy today's episode of the Poor Boys Horology Podcast. Welcome to the April episode of the Poor Boys Horology Podcast. And uh, you notice the background has changed just a little bit in the last uh, month and a half or so. It's been about that long since I've recorded a podcast. We recorded the March podcast back in February so that I could kind of get ahead of my move. I'm in Maryland now, and so we're in a new home, and it looks a little different from the home in Florida. But we're getting settled in here now, and uh, thought it's time to do another podcast especially because we had a new advertiser. Maybe you're wondering why I'm wearing a baseball jersey right now. It's because we should be in baseball season, people! Maybe you didn't realize it or not, but uh, we're in the midst of tyranny right now. I want to give a big shout-out to Tucker Carlson over at Fox News. Uh, He had the governor of New Jersey on the other night, and he just point-blank asked that joker, He said, uh, you know, you've basically violated the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of New Jersey in pretty much every executive order that you have issued in regards to the coronavirus. He said, by what authority do you do that? He said, what gives you the authority to just chunk the Constitution and to implement what is essentially martial law? He said, where do you get that authority? The governor could not answer that question. Is there a pandemic going on right now? Or as some people call it, the plan-demic? I don't know. Uh, is it a bioweapon? It very seriously could be. I don't know what's going on right now. But I do know this. I know that the Constitution of the United States was written during a time of national emergency. It was written in a time of crisis. And it does not have an 11th Amendment that says, hey... Uh, You know, everything that we just said is all fine and dandy unless there's an epidemic or a pandemic going on, in which case just ignore everything that we've said up to this point. Okay, that's not there. So again, I have to ask the question, by what authority, if you will, is this great tyranny happening? And so now that I've commented on that, and like I said, we should be in the midst of baseball season right now, I should be watching ball games. But let's get back to the subject at hand. Let me do a quick wristwatch check here. This is the Orient Defender. Uh, Just got it in the mail earlier this week. Here a little bit later in the broadcast, we are going to do an unboxing of this very watch that I'm wearing right now. Uh, Before that, we are going to have a word from our sponsor, who is author J.D.R. Hawkins. And we're going to be talking for just a couple of minutes about her book, her award-winning book, which is a War Between the States novel. And then uh, we're also going to do something which is kind of unique for a horology podcast. We are going to have some Lego assemblies for Easter. I got uh, some Lego sets in my Easter basket. I'm going to put them together. One of them is Jesus Turning Water into Wine Lego set, and the other is the Nativity Blocks, which is kind of a knockoff Lego the nativity blocks of Moses and the Ten Commandments. And so you'll get to see me assemble those. Hopefully you'll enjoy that. Hopefully that will be a neat thing for you to watch. But what I want to talk about in today's podcast is watches that I would take into the apocalypse. And this is one watch right here that uh, of all the watches that I own, this is probably the one that I would take into the apocalypse. It is a Casio Wave Scepter. It is a solar uh, chronograph. It is also an atomic clock uh, watch so that it sets itself to the atomic clock. And it's, uh, I've had this thing now for almost 10 years and it just seems to be indestructible. 
and I was wearing it, in fact, just the other day. And it just, it just, you know, this, this would be maybe my watch to take into the apocalypse. I don't know. This is not a watch that was ever sold in the United States. I had to order this one from Japan. That said, that's not very hard to do. You can get them on Amazon. And when you get it, it'll have Japanese instructions. You'll have to go to Casio, to their website, and just tell them that you purchased this on Amazon, that you're in the United States, that you do not speak Japanese. And they will be very happy to send you a PDF file, which is the instructions translated into English. Uh, but this would be my watch of choice for going into the apocalypse of all of the watches that I own. Perhaps, if not that watch, my second watch of choice would probably be one of my Vostok military watches. One of my old Soviet-era military watches would probably be another one of my choices. You say, why? Because they're automatic movements or they are 17-joule hand-winding movements. They keep good time and they're workhorses and they're just indestructible. And they're just basic watches. They, they do their job. And they do it well. And, you know, it would be dependable. And they can withstand the rigors. You can put them underwater. You can put them in the mud. Uh, you can put them in the grime. Uh, you could, you know, you can bang around in them. It just, this would be my watch. Or uh, possibly, and this is one of the reasons why I ordered this watch here, the Orient Defender, is I thought to myself, you know, maybe this would be the watch. I'll tell you how I found out about the Orient Defender. I was watching some other horology podcasts, some other watch podcasts. And in light of this pandemic, everybody seems to be talking about the watches that they would take into the apocalypse. And a lot of the people said, hey, you know, I would want this Orient Defender. So I got to looking at it and I thought, you know, that is kind of a cool watch. Maybe that is the watch uh, for me. And of course, I have a fascination with military watches. And so what did I do? I ordered one. And yes, it's quite possible that this might be the watch that I would take into the apocalypse. I'm not quite for sure. Of course, if I really thought the apocalypse were coming, and by the way, I do not believe that this is the apocalypse. Do I believe that, that everything's as serious as we're being told it is on TV? You know, I don't know what to believe right now. But I do know this. I know that I fear my government's response to the disease far worse than I fear the disease. You know, I told somebody this the other day. I'm not going to name drop here, but let me just say that uh, if I name drop them, you would know who they are because they're a big time celebrity. I told, I told them, I said that, you know, the president's been calling it fake news for years and now I'm just supposed to believe everything that they tell me. Or, you know, who is, who is the one who's supposed to help me through all this? The same government that's been screwing us for the last hundred years? I mean, again, who are we supposed to believe in this? And so I just don't know who to believe or what to believe. But I know I fear right now, I fear the tyranny that I'm seeing far more than I fear the disease. I, you know, hey, if you want to, if you want to copy paste a tinfoil hat on my head, go ahead. But, you know, I, I fear the globalist and I fear the powers that be and I fear the elite. And I fear the, if you want to call me a conspiracy kook, I fear the new world order. I fear the socialist and the communist things that are being implanted into our society and into our government and into our way of life right now far more than I fear this disease itself. Uh, but all that said, I do not believe it's the apocalypse. I do not believe it's the end of the world. I do believe it may be the end of the world as we've known it. I believe it may be the end of, of freedom and life in America as we've known it. And you say, well, no, because everything will go back to normal, but does it really? Let me give you an example of that, 9-11. You say, well, life eventually went back to normal, but did it? The Patriot Act hasn't gone away. The Real ID Act is still moving forward. Uh, the surveillance state got stronger and stronger. In other words, uh, what was it that Rahm Emanuel, the chief of staff of Barack Obama, used to say, never let a good crisis go to waste. Crisis was utilized in order to affect a certain things, which we're still dealing with in our society. And so tyranny managed to advance the football 10 or 15 yards down the field. 
I think with this uh, pandemic, I think the same thing's going to happen. Will we see an ease on these restrictions? Yes, we will. But uh, essentially what's happened in the last couple of months is we've seen healthcare rationing going into place. And when the healthcare system collapses in this country, somebody is going to have to pick up its pieces and who's that going to be? The government. And when that happens, we're going to have nationalized healthcare in this system or we're going to have socialized medicine. And all of the people who've spent decades fighting that will now be rejoicing that, that the government is you know doing this. And so, in other words, the powers that be are moving the football down the field. And they're going to pick up another 10, 15, 20 yards down the field. You know, even Donald Trump right now is talking about what they call a universal basic income, which is pretty much a staple in communist and socialist countries. You know, it's amazing how when Bernie Sanders or Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer talk about these things, they're socialist and communist. But why isn't Donald Trump when he talks about it? I just... Yeah. You know, anyways, uh, but what is my point? My point is is that the forces of evil are moving their football down the field once again, and they're getting that much closer to their goal line. So, you know, I don't know. I will say this though, as I've studied pandemics, is the Black Death ravaged Europe. It ravaged England in particular and France, and the Black Death destroyed. It annihilated the feudal system in England and also in France and in Europe. And what took its place was capitalism. And of course, capitalism has been perverted uh, over the years and it's kind of morphed into what I would now call a corporate fascism. It's not true capitalism anymore. But capitalism in that early day was definitely far superior to the feudalism that it replaced. And... So that's my hope is that is is the response to this epidemic, to this pandemic is going to destroy the economies of the world. But my hope is that rising out of their place will be a new and a better way. And so even though, you know, the forces of evil are at work in all this, you know, what does the Bible say? It says where sin doth abound, grace doth much more abound. And so perhaps God will be merciful and the forces of evil will not gain the ultimate victory, and we will see something even better emerging out of this, that the old system can collapse and a new and better one can take its place. At least we can always have that hope. Uh, but again, back, on, back into horology. I do not believe that this is the apocalypse. I do not believe it is the end of the world, but I do believe that there is something interesting to be said for uh, what watch would I take into the apocalypse? And so that's what I want to talk about in today's Poor Boys Horology podcast. But first, let's have uh, just a brief word from our sponsor for today's podcast, that being uh, author J.D.R. Hawkins. And then when we're done with this, just a couple of minutes here of me talking with, uh, with the author about her great book, and then we'll come back and I'll share with you a Casio watch. Not the one I showed you earlier, but a different one. A Casio G-Shock. And I'm not a G-Shock fan, folks. In fact, here a few months ago, I think it was right before Christmas, I was noticing G-Shock showing up in our Amazon uh, saved items list. And I just looked at my wife. I said, honey, please tell me you're not thinking about buying me a G-Shock uh, for Christmas. Because of all the watches in the world, that is the last thing in the world that I would ever want is a G-Shock. <laughs> but uh, they're quartz, they're ugly. Uh, but that said, I, I saw this G-Shock recently and I thought, you know, if I really thought the apocalypse was coming, I'm going to buy one of these. But I haven't bought it because I don't know that the apocalypse is coming right now. I don't think that. But anyways, let's talk to J.D.R. Hawkins real quick and then we'll come back and we'll talk about the Casio G-Shock. All right, well, I've got uh, author J.D.R. Hawkins on the phone here, and we're going to talk about her award-winning book. So I know that the book won the John Eston Koch Award. Tell us about some of the other awards that the book has won. It made honorable mention at the L.A. Book Festival, and it won the 2012 Bragg Medallion, which is given to indie books, um, independently published books. And this book originally was published 
several years ago with iUniverse. I published it myself, self-published. Um, and then I found a hybrid publisher, so it was with them for a while, and now it's with another new publisher <laughs> called Westwood Books Publishing, and they're located in Florida. And so the title of the book is A Beautiful Glittering Lie. How did you come up with the title, A Beautiful Glittering Lie? The beginning of each chapter starts with a quote from various Civil War characters, personalities, and such. Henry Morton Stanley, CSA, and he wrote, For it was the first field of glory I had seen in my May of life, and the first time that glory sickened me with its repulsive aspect and made me suspect it was all a glittering lie. This is the first, or book one, of the Renegade series. Is Has book two and three or so forth been written yet? Yes, they've, they've both been written. There's been a fourth book written, too. Um, the second book, The Beckoning Hellfire, just came out with Westwood, Westwood Books. And the third one, Rebel Among Us, is in process so it'll probably be out first part of may i would guess this might be an unfair question but i'm mm-hmm. gonna i'm gonna let our podcast of viewers in on the fact that you are also the lead singer of the julie hawkins band what is your greater passion the music or the writing when we lived in mississippi a few years ago i was really involved with the memphis music foundation DeSoto songwriters group and did a lot of performing at various festivals and things like that. Now I'm back in Colorado, but for now I am just focusing on the writing and getting my books republished and then getting the fourth book in the series published. Give us just one quick teaser here, something that would make somebody want to rush over to Amazon or to your website right now. In the spring of 1861, a country once united is fractured by war. Half of America fights for the Confederate cause, the other for unification. Rebel forces have already seized Fort Morgan and Fort Gaines. A new Confederate president has been elected, and the Constitution has been revised. In North Alabama, a farmer and a father of three decides to enlist. For Hiram Summers, it is the end of everything he has ever known. After Hiram travels to Virginia with the 4th Alabama Infantry Regiment, he is quickly thrust into combat. His son, David, who must stay behind, searches for adventure at home by tracing to Huntsville with his best friend, Jake Kimball, to, scrut- to scrutinize invading Yankees. Meanwhile, Carolyn, Hiram's wife and David's mother, struggles to keep up with the farm as her world revolves around the letter she receives from her husband, whom she misses dearly. As Hiram and his son discover the true meaning of war, they soon realize that their choices have torn their family apart. In this historical tale, the naivete of young country is tested. A father sacrifices everything to defend his home. And a young man longs for adventure regardless of the perilous cost. So that kind of sums it up. <laughs> um, yeah, the whole series revolves around this family from North Alabama. So it's a family saga. Uh, it starts at the very beginning when um, President Davis is being sworn into office, and it goes through to the end of the war with book three. And then book four, which hasn't been published yet, will discuss Reconstruction and what happens after the war. Well, we would definitely like to encourage all of our podcast viewers to tune in to, or rather to visit on the internet, Amazon.com or the Barnes & Noble website, Type in A Beautiful Glittering Lie by J.D.R. Hawkins. A Beautiful Glittering Lie by J.D.R. Hawkins into their search bar. And uh, find out about this great book and get yourself a copy of it. And uh, maybe even look at the other books in the series as well. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. God bless. You too. Bye. Bye. The watch that I would take into the apocalypse, it is the Casio G-Shock Rangeman watch. It's a new offering by Casio. It has a ceramic case back. It has a really hard composite plastic construction. It's solar powered. It is just an awesome watch. It has Bluetooth capability. It has GPS. So uh, that is a little bit of a drain on the solar powered battery. Uh, But as long as you're keeping it exposed to light, you don't have to worry about it dying. It can, it can, the watch can keep up. 
It's got a barometer. It's got altimeter. It's, uh, it's got a heart rate monitor. It'll tell you the temperature. And the GPS will tell you the route that you've taken so that you can backtrack. Uh, if you can give it a set of coordinates, it can tell you how to get there. It, it's just... It's just an amazing, amazing watch, uh, the things that this watch can do. And so you want to check that out, the G-Shock Rangeman. And uh, just, just look into that, and it is just an awesome, awesome watch. Well, anyways, uh, let's go ahead now, and let's uh, look at those LEGO constructions. And uh, then we'll have a brief word from another one of our sponsors, uh, the Barnes Review Magazine. And then uh, we'll go into our unboxing and our review of this little beauty, the Orient Defender. I got something very interesting in my Easter basket this year. In fact, I got at least two somethings very interesting. One is the Jesus Turns Water Into Wine Lego set with real Lego parts. And the other is the Nativity Bricks, <clears throat> which is, I guess, a uh, knockoff Lego. And it is uh, Moses. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to assemble these here on the Poor Boys Horology podcast. I know this seems weird. We're going to peel this paper back here, and it's a sealed in a foil envelope. I know this seems like a weird thing to do on a horology podcast, but uh, let's see what's inside here. Them toys. Okay, a little, uh, little coin, a little token there. And, of course, the Jesus turns the water into wine set here made with Lego parts. But I know my wife was excited for me to put these together. And so I thought as a gift to her that I would put them together here on the podcast. And so we got the legs there on Jesus. And uh, now we've got the hands. Actually, I think I, I put the legs on backwards. So now we've got the legs on right there. And it looks more like Luke Skywalker than Jesus there with that outfit, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, there's the face. And uh, there's the hair. Of course, uh, I don't know why everybody's so fascinated with long-haired Jesuses. Uh, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, it says, Doth not even nature itself teach that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. But I don't think that Jesus would have done anything that would have been contrary to the Scripture. And so I somehow doubt that Jesus had long hair. Of course, Jesus lived during the Roman era. And if you were to... If you were to study a history, you would find uh, all of the busts and all of the paintings and all of the sculptures of men in that era, they all had very short uh, cropped hair. And so long hair was not even the style, if you will, in Jesus's day. Uh, I doubt very seriously that Jesus had long hair, but you know, be that as it may, everybody's fascinated with long haired Jesus. Anyways, let's get this on here. I'm not for sure exactly. Oh, this is a wine bottle. Okay, I get it now. So here's the water, and here is the wine. And of course, we'll put that up there. And so here is the wine cup, the Holy Grail. Just the other day, I was watching Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Remember the old knight, thou hast chosen wisely. And uh, Indiana Jones, when asked how he knew which cup was the Holy Grail, he said, well, this is the cup of a carpenter. Here we have Jesus here pouring the wine into, I guess we could say, the Holy Grail. And here's the table and with the bread and the fish. And so we have just put together the uh, Jesus turning water into wine Lego set. I hope that you enjoyed watching me do that. And so now let's go to Moses here. We've got Moses, uh, the Tivity Bricks, the Moses set. And so let's uh, let's open that up here, and uh, let's see what we got. Let me move Jesus over to the side here. I don't know if he'll still be in the camera shot or not. I assume he will be. We'll find out here in a second. There's a little bit of delay in uh, what's coming from my camera to what's going to my screen. Let's grab a pair of scissors here, and we'll cut this package. Dump the little pieces out here. Moses has his little staff. Moses's arms, I guess. Let's see here. This is an interesting way to build a Lego man. I've never seen a Lego man that I've had to put the arms together like this. 
I have to ask my son. He's built a lot more Lego stuff than I have. But I've never had to do anything like that. Moses, uh, Moses has no beard. He has no eyes. Let's see here. Maybe. Oh, here we go. That's why the beard goes on there. I'm guessing. And then, okay. And then the hair. And now Moses has the staff. Looks like a big lightsaber. He almost looks like Obi-Wan Kenobi wearing that robe. And let me look at the box here. Okay, so Moses should have in this hand, he should have, these are the Ten Commandments. Moses, of course, stands on this Lego platform. And so now we have Moses, and we have Moses, and we have Jesus. Hopefully both of those are in camera angle shot. We will stand them back up. Jesus here at the Last Supper and Moses there on his little Lego platform. And it can be the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Jesus can have a nice little conversation while the other apostles uh, just kind of observe it in the background. But I hope you enjoyed the putting together of the Nativity Bricks, Moses, and the Lego Jesus turning the water into wine set. What I'm using to hold my camera is actually my LED lamp, and you see the base of the lamp there. I just put the Lego figures on it. That is a beautiful uh, little lamp. That's actually a phone charging stand there. I could set my phone on that. Of course, my phone is what I'm using for the camera right now, but I could set my phone on that, and it uh, is a contact charger, so you know it, it charges the phone for me while the phone is sitting there on the base of this LED desk lamp. And of course, the let me go ahead and, and move the camera there just so that you can see it. On the base of the lamp, there's a clock, and it also tells me the temperature and the date and everything else. I saw that in the Aldi store, the grocery store Aldi, and it was like $20, and I thought, I've got to have this. As a horologist, to have my desk lamp and my desk clock all in the same little your unit. web browser and type in www.barnesreview.org and discover the Barnes Review magazine. In the Barnes Review, you will read vignettes of man, from the prehistoric to the very recent, from forgotten races and civilizations to first-person accounts of World War II and the late Cold War. There is no more interesting magazine published today, nor a more significant and important subject than real history. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. You can subscribe to receive the Barnes Review magazine in its print form, or in convenient electronic delivery. Our host has been a subscriber to both formats for years. So visit www.barnesreview.org and subscribe to the Barnes Review. And what I'm going to do now is I am going to, let me put the box up under there. This is an Orient. It is an Orient Defender. It is uh, FET-0N002K0 is the model number. Of course, Orient has a lot longer uh, model numbers than do any other uh, watch company, it seems. But uh, Orient, uh, let's do the Orient Defender here. This came in the mail earlier this week, and I wanted to unbox it, particularly right here on this podcast so let me move that there just a little bit we'll start to open up the box here of course it is the white cardboard orient box and inside that is the really nice uh, leather or fake leather and metal orient box and we open that and of course we find a 
pillow there. We find the Orient uh, logo there. We find a beautiful Orient Defender watch and underneath the pillow, of course, is all of the paperwork and the guarantees and everything. And so let's move that to the side there. And let's look at this Orient Defender watch. And it is on a leather strap. It comes with a tag here. And it's got a nice, heavy uh, clasp. The watch has good weight to it. It has a good feel to it. It is set for the 22nd. Of course, today is the 18th. It shows to be Wednesday. It's got a 24-hour dial here. It also has the date here. But it does not have the little push buttons for those complications. It all has to be set here with the crown so let me pull the crown out the crown doesn't pull out the crown is a screw down so let me unscrew the crown and i can pull it out one and here i am moving one two three four five six seven eight nine ten but you'll notice that the day is not moving with the date. I can move this the other direction and it just, I feel it clicking, but nothing's happening. So in order to adjust the day on the complication, I am going to have to, I moved it now to Thursday. I'm soon to be to Friday. You're at about the four o'clock a.m. position before the day moves. Let me decide, let's see here now. So today is Saturday, so I need to go to the 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th, and then I'll pull it out again. We'll begin moving the time again. We're now at noon on the 17th, Friday. We're on the 18th, which is today at midnight. Let's see here again. Okay, we're at about the 3.30 position, and it went into Saturday, and we will flip this here. We're at noon. It is 154 according to my Mac, so we will go to 154. Push that in. It is not, uh, no winding there. So it is not a, um, a windable, hackable movement. So we're gonna have to do the Seiko shuffle here, the Orient shuffle. I can hear it winding as I shake it. Maybe you can hear it too. The wristwatch that I am wearing right now, it is a Citizen. It is an Echo Drive. I'm gonna take it off. It's a solar powered, I guess that'll sit up under the light there. Let it get a little more charge. I am gonna take this here Take my scissors here, cut this. Put that with the box. Let's see how this fits on the wrist. It's got a, the leather band has a nice feel to it. The stainless steel of the housing has a nice feel. Let me go ahead and do this before I put it on. Let me go ahead and give you a close up here of the back of the watch. And it's got a Orient, uh, genuine Orient uh, leather band here. You can see the Orient markings there on the back of the watch. The uh, the stainless steel here is not polished. It's it's a, a, a plain finish here. The only polish that you can see visible when you're wearing the watch is of course the, uh, the screw down crown. But let me get that in there. Got a nice Orient signed clasp. Get that in there. I may eventually put a NATO strap on this. 22 millimeters here. It's uh, a beautiful watch I chose for the gray dial. It kind of looks in this light and maybe on the camera it might look a little greenish, but it's actually a gray and it came with a black leather strap. And it is just a beautiful, beautiful watch. It is the Orient Defender. It is Orient's military watch. It has a fully automatic movement. It has uh, the day and the date complication as well as a 24-hour dial. But I just uh, saw this and I said, you know, I have a fascination with military watches. I said, let me, let me get one of these. And it's, it's good purchase, a good purchase so far. And I got it on eBay. I ended up giving 115 
uh, dollars and some change by the time I paid a couple of dollars for shipping. I don't know why this particular seller didn't have free shipping and there was also some sales tax involved. And so to get it shipped to my home from New Jersey ended up costing $121 and change. And it took about three days to get to me, which was really kind of cool considering the fact that so many things are being delayed in what we are now calling a pandemic. And so that is today's Poor Boys Horology podcast, our podcast for the month of April 2020. I hope that you've enjoyed watching it. Maybe you would like to advertise in one of our uh, shows. Right now we have a really sweet special going on. And uh, for just $10, you can advertise uh, in our next podcast. So if you want to email me at poorboyshorologypodcast at aol.com, I should have the email address up on the screen there for you. Uh, you can ask me about advertising in an upcoming podcast. And of course, you know, these will stay online hopefully for years and we'll just get more and more and more and more and more and more and more, and more hits. And so you'll be able to get in early and <clears throat> advertise, of course, as our podcasts begin to go viral and our viewership increases, we're going to have to raise the price of advertising in a podcast. But right now, you can get a sponsorship in there. You can advertise and you can do that very affordably. So I'd like to encourage you to do that. Uh, if you're like me, uh, you know, one of the things that I've kind of complained about is that we were paying uh, a lot of money for our son to go to a private school and yet we're having to homeschool him. And the curriculum that we're using for that is called the Christendom Curriculum. They've advertised on previous episodes of the podcast. And we're going to conclude today's broadcast with, um, with another one of their advertisements. So, you know, hey, uh, you know, stay safe out there, stay strong, and, uh, you know, just continue fighting the good fight until next month. I'll see you again for the May episode of the Poor Boy Serology Podcast. Welcome to the Christendom Curriculum. You know, every parent who decides to homeschool wants to secure a great education for their child, while also saving time and money. But these days, many parents have another concern. They also want a homeschool curriculum without all the multiculturalist, politically correct diversity doctrine that's really little more than a thin disguise for an anti-Christian, anti-American, and anti-Western civilization bias. Now there is such a curriculum. The Christendom curriculum gives your children a complete education in Bible, history, literature, and more focusing on the classic academic skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic. But we also tell the story of Christendom, the story of the Christian nations, especially as Christ's kingdom has been historically manifest in the nations of Europe and America. And we do so without apology. The Christendom curriculum is the only Christian nationalist homeschool program you'll find. We support the right of the European and American peoples to their historic Christian cultures against the globalist leftists who want to destroy those cultures. Not only that, but we provide assigned reading courses for various hot-button subjects in our current culture wars, including feminism, social justice, and cultural Marxism, among others. These reading courses will teach your kids how to survive a social justice warrior attack how to debate with leftists on social media, how to reform their local churches and communities, and more. We're living in a time of tremendous historical and social change. Christians have the opportunity now to begin building the culture and civilization of the next thousand years and beyond. It's an exciting time to be alive. So if you want to help raise the next generation of culture warriors, if you want your children to grow up with a love for Christ's kingdom and for their own nation, while at the same time learning how to defend America and rebuild the West, the easy-to-use Christendom curriculum is for you. Click the Learn More button to get in on the action. And thanks for listening.